Welcome to the lecture series of Public Theology, a cooperation of the Berlin Institute for Public Theology, the Bayer's Now Day Center for Public Theology, and the Lutheran World Federation. Hello, it is good to meet you all in this way for our lecture today on contextuality and intercontextuality in public theology. My name is Rudolf von Sinner and I speak to you from a very cold Brazil. You probably wouldn't believe that it can be so cold there, but it was minus three degrees this morning. So really shivering, that's why I had to dress very well. I'm Swiss by origin, uh, I've been living and working in Brazil for the last 20 years. Uh, I'm teaching systematic theology at the Pontifical Catholic University in Curitiba, where I also had the graduate program. And one of my research interests and research emphases is on public theology. Another one is on ecumenism and interreligious dialogue. Before, I taught for 16 years at the Lutheran School of Theology in São Leopoldo, 700 kilometers further south from here. I hope we'll have an excellent time together now as we reflect on this very important topic. Check it out. A very warm welcome to all of you for this lecture on contextuality and intercontextuality in public theology. To get us started, I would like to present four theses which steer us through what follows and which I try to show also in what way they are pertinent. First one is, public theology is nothing new. It is biblical and part of the DNA, so to speak, of theology to be public and assume public responsibility. We just have to have a look at Jesus' proclamation and practice. This is, therefore, intercontextual, Catholic in a broad sense. The Gospel transcends boundaries, and the triune God we believe in is one. The public space, second thesis, or public sphere, is in its specific configuration something very contextual and in transformation. This is precisely one of the appeals of a public theology today, much of which was developed or is being developed in transforming or highly transforming societies. The third thesis, also the specific role of the churches and theology in such specific public space, is of course contextual. While the calling is one, it is lived out in each context in a very specific way. And fourth thesis, there is an intercontextual articulation between public theology, which is very fruitful and necessary, contemplating post- and decolonial, as well as world Christianity perspectives. We come to the third slide and want to look into what now is the difference between public and private, at least how it is defined and distinct since Aristotle and a very strong in the Western tradition, it might be much less clear or strong in other contexts, but I still believe the difference makes some sense in as much as we have something which has to do with all of us, with the whole of a society of a nation, where you have a government, where you have a state structure, you have an administration, where you have um, institutions of what we call civil society that work for the whole of society in terms of uh, transformation of fighting against social injustice, against gender injustice, against race injustice, for instance. So these are public issues, whereas the private is what belongs to a specific, more circumstrict context, what belongs to a family, an individual, or a clan. So the public, uh, which comes from the Greek polis, the city, and a uh, Brazilian anthropologist Roberto da Mata calls it the street, where we move around in a more general way. Whereas the private, the oikos from the Greek, oikos house, is the house, which is our family and individual surrounding. So the public is what belongs to all, what needs to be known to all. There must not be a secret policy, but uh, whenever policy for the public is concerned, it has to be open, it has to be uh, accessible, it has to be transparent. And, especially as it comes to our elected representatives, they have accountability towards the whole of society. In the private context of the House, uh, its right to freedom needs to be protected precisely from an undue um, taking 
or an anon to attack, as it were, of the state, of the church, or of any other um, big institution that uh, wants to take care of our private lives. This is our freedom, where we make our own decisions. So, historically, this space had to be preserved and protected against outside forces. One of the most important philosophers of, contem of the contemporary times from Germany, this is slide number four now, is Jürgen Habermas. And he distinguishes precisely between, on the one hand, the political system, which is the government, the administration, uh, the judiciary, the executive, the legislative, and on the other hand, the life world, which is our daily life, where we, uh, where we meet with family, where we go to school, where we work, where we uh, have leisure. So all these encounters that are on a daily basis, this is the life world. And in between, we have the public sphere, as how Habermas calls it, a resonance box, where civil society uh, is active, sometimes also specifically called civil, uh, organized civil society. So this is where opinion is formed, where discourse, as it says, happens, debate, discussion. And uh, as to Habermas' thesis of communic communicative action, he says this should be a space where power is not different between people, but all people are equally um, welcome, do equally have access to this debate. Now, we know that this is not a reality. Power uh, structures are present everywhere, whether they are formal or informal. However, the possibility to come together and debate and raise one's voice has, in its intention and uh, in its potential, an emancipatory function. It can free. And therefore, the, the force of the argument, of the rational argument, rather than uh, of birthrights or of, um, of money or of other ways that make people powerful has a strong appeal, I believe, when uh, discussion is possible and everyone can bring uh, his or her own anxieties and wishes and ideas to the public sphere. So there is a discussion, there's a debate, it is it is um, discursive, as says Habermas, and it brings the anxieties and wishes from the life world to the political system and communicates back what the political system does with it to the life world. Now, in some contexts, like in Brazil itself, uh, the public sphere is not only discursive, it is also deliberative. That means it takes certain decisions itself. For instance, when the so-called public budgeting um, a certain quantity of the municipal budget is discussed on and decided upon by all citizens that can and want to come together to decide on this, whatever it is used for schooling, for new uh, leisure areas, for um, ways of fostering economic activity. So the public sphere, while in the first place discursive, can also be deliberative. On the next slide now, we see features uh, of a public theology as formulated by Heinrich Bedford Strom, but also taken up by persons like Dion Forster from South Africa and Min Soo Kim from Korea. There is, on the one hand, a biblical theological profile, which makes it properly a theology. But it is an interdisciplinary Theology. It has interdisciplinarity, it dialogues not only but specifically in the academy and university with other areas of knowledge. It therefore needs a bilinguality because it has to translate what believers believe in and what believers want to have, um, have recognized and want to see as what impels them for their actions in daily life. They have to translate that into a language which is open and accessible to all. It can from there also acquire competence for political orientation so that a theological, a public theology can in fact help politicians to see certain aspects clearer uh, than they would without such orientation. 
So this is one aspect also Heinrich Bedford-Strom uh, puts to the fore. He says it has a prophetic quality and therefore it is critical. It raises the voice for the marginalized, for those who have a difficulty in voicing their own voices, are usually not heard. So the churches and theology have to take that function of um, raising uh, the voice, raising the attention for the marginalized persons, like refugees, for instance, where Heinrich Bedford Strom has been a strong, uh, always strongly engaged towards the welcoming of refugees and of treating them with dignity. And then also comes the intercontextuality, precisely the dimension where a different context, and we've seen all, already South Africa and Korea can take that up with gain. Um, they are networking and learning from each other on a global scale. On the next slide, we see some categories uh, which make a basic distinction in public theology. One is more interested in the universality of it and the fundamentation. So in what way does uh, theology um, recall something profoundly human and something profoundly rational in a rationality that is supposed, more or less supposed to be universal? And the Chicago School, around David Tracy, for instance, sees an analogy between theology and philosophy, between God and the world. So, um, to speak about God and theology in a secular world is not inventing something totally alien to it, but has to translate what it says into a publicly available language, which, however, ultimately draws on the same sources. The Yale School, especially Stanley Hauerwas and others, however, have a st more strongly dialectic view and see we first have to separate God and theology and faith from living in the world and see how do, as Hauerwas would say, how do Christian communities as testimonies, as they, as they were strangers, live in the world and give their witness there. So we can have a stronger um, connection between God and the world or a strong, stronger distinction, but a dialogue has to be there in any case. That is what public theology is always about. So the other emphasis is on contextuality, on the practice. What precisely is going on in the public sphere? How can it be analyzed? How do churches and theology exercise their role in this public sphere? And how do they contribute to justice and transformation, which specifically is important in contexts like South Africa, where inequalities are enormously uh, strong, and also in Brazil, the same case there, where a small group of rich has a huge amount of wealth, whereas a, a huge group of poor has virtually nothing and where still distinctions between men and women, between whites and blacks uh, and other population groups are very, very strong. So how to overcome these separations and these antagonisms in a post-apartheid South Africa or in Brazil in a post-military regime. So public theology seeks to both be critical towards what's happening in this context and to be constructive. Eneida Jacobson, a, a young Brazilian theologian today living in the U.S. says a public theology has to be anchored in the life world, but also affirms in dialogue with Habermas that rational discourse can be emancipated. So she precisely reinforces what I tried to say when I was speaking uh, about Habermas just a minute ago. We come to the next slide, which is now my own position on public theology which I see, especially in the Brazilian context, seeks to reflect on the factual presence and the role of the churches and theology in the public sphere. So it has a descriptive part to it. How are religious communities, and in our case specifically Christian churches, present in the public sphere? And how should they, that's now the normative part, how should they be present? It seeks in the second place to analyze the pertinence to the different forms of religious presence. Is there too little, too much? Precisely, again, this normative question. Does it contribute towards the common good? Or are churches acting in the public sphere on their own interest, for themselves only? 
Third, it seeks to serve as dialogue partner with other areas of knowledge, the government and administration, with civil society and the churches. And finally, it seeks to practice like Jesus, paresia, sincerity, openness, transparency and courage, and kenosis, the taking back like in the letter to Philippians chapter 2, the emptying of power, which Jesus, when as the Son of God, he becomes human, he empties himself of divine power and assumes the role of a weak human being for which eventually he dies, but then is resurrected by God. So Jesus in his earthly life, shows both boldness and humility as an example to how churches and theology should and can act in the public sphere. Now there is, we come to the next slide, quite a bit of critique towards a public theology. On the one hand, there it's a, it is said there is a gender bias. It is done by men, usually. Uh, there is also a race bias. It's not only men, but usually white men who do not, so says the critique, um, consider seriously enough the issue of inf and influence of race and the power difference it installs. It is also said that public theology is something universalistic which is imposed by one specific position on all the others. It wants to be the theology, not just one Another point is to say it is naive in seeking a harmony, a collaboration with everyone, rather than resistance. All that is happening is not good. All people that are in the public sphere are not good. There is evil. There is uh, the exer exercise of power against others rather than uh, for the common good. And there is anger among those who are not part, who do not participate in the goods society could be offering for them. And a fifth critique, which is very common, it says it attempts to substitute liberation theology. It's an unfriendly takeover. Three of these critics are here on their photographs. We see on the one hand, in the bottom right, Tiniko Maluleke from South Africa, who says he's even wary of public theology. It, it doesn't help anything, according to him. And it doesn't take seriously, precisely, the anger that is there and the factual... Um, ruptures that are in society. It is too harmonious and too universalistic. Esther McIntosh, top right, she does public theology, and she calls what she does public theology, but she does it in a critical way, precisely because she says it tends to be exclusively of women and people of other gender identities. And therefore, this critique has to be discussed in public theology, and the voice of women has to be taken into account and be made public. Like you cannot speak about the public and the public sphere if the whole public, or all the publics, if you want to use a plural, are there. And then we have Rodney Chaka, to the left, uh, who does not use for himself public theology as a concept, but he is in critical dialogue with public theology with some of the criticisms already voiced, which he also voices, especially in terms of uh, having to, to take into account its race bias and race as subject matter and as a, trans as, a, as a necessity, a need for transformation and justice, which has to be taken into account. Now, I do some tentative answers. This critique has to be heard and taken seriously, very seriously, of course. So it is not for me, and I do not intend to, uh, here to answer in a way that this critique is not valid or um, has to be overcome, not in this sense. But I want to respond to it from my point of view, which is first to say that as for all theology, sensitivity towards biases in terms of gender, race or even others, and a rigorous self-critique are always necessary and call for intentional action, to, for instance, to promote black theology, to promote feminist theology, to promote affirmative action. In my view, it is wrong also to see public theology as an importation from the North, especially the United States. Even if one of the narratives leads back to Reinhold Niebuhr, Martin Marty and David Tracy in the United States, it is only one of the six named by South African Dirk Smit, and you can see uh, his text in further reading. 
Public theology in Brazil was to a high degree inspired not by the United States nor by Europe, but by South African public theology. It's a South-South dialogue that has inspired us and helps us so much. Third, public theology, as I try to show, is developed from within, from and for a specific context. At the same time, it can and does benefit from intercontextual exchange and joins under the horizon of one interrelated world and the one triune God. And it is different from public theology, uh, from liberation theology, as it seeks more strongly to negotiate constructively in an ever more pluralistic public sphere. However, it must not, and in my view does not, leave out resistance where necessary. It does not seek to create a simple harmony. And furthermore, it is here, but not a substitution, to liberation theology, central assets of the preferential option for the poor and of praxis as a source for theology. So in many public theologians, you can see that they harvest many of the insights of liberation theology and are highly inspired by liberation theology, but have different accents. And therefore, it is not to be confused, it is not to be a substitution, but it is connected. We come to the next slide, uh, just for you to see that there's a number of authors in different contexts, from Argentina to Switzerland, and this is an incomplete list. So, there is factually an intercontextuality, there is a contextuality, and we need more discussion on this. Therefore, I suggest you take up these three points for your further discussion. What are the main challenges in your specific context today? What is the place and role of the church and of theology in your context? And are the churches in your context being faithful to the gospel and contributing to the common good? And I give you further three indications for further reading. The text by Dirk Smith, I've already mentioned, a text by Nader Jacobson as one example of a discussion of public and contextual, and a text of my own about what public theology can look like in Brazil. I hope you have good readings, good discussions, good reflections, and thank you for your attention.